Hi, greetings. It's me, Dr. Paul Gerhardt, and this is the 10th video in our Essentials of Negotiation series. This particular video is going to focus on multiple parties, groups, and teams in negotiations. So let's get right down to it. Uh, what is the nature of multi-party negotiations? Well, a multi-party negotiation is one in which uh, more than two interested parties are working together at the table to achieve a particular objective. There are some differences between two-party negotiations and multi-party negotiations. Uh, the number of parties, social roles may change the power and status during talks. Informational and, and, and computational complexity. There's tracking solution boundaries uh, that can be a real challenge. Uh, social complexity. Uh, social group dynamics affect negotiator behavior. And procedural uh, complexity and, and discussing multiple issues at the same time leads to better agreements. Uh, logistical complexity, uh, they facilitate integrative agreements by bringing parties physically close uh, and then uh, some interpretation may be needed. St uh, strategic complexity, dealing with each strategy may lead to distributive tactics. Uh, strategic control of party numbers lead to coalition building and then snowball coalitions. Past of, or future relations may shape current discussions. Let's talk about the dynamics uh, that can make multi-party uh, negotiations effective. So test assumptions and inferences is important. Uh, share as much uh, relevant information as possible. Focus on interests, not positions. Explain the reasons behind your statements, questions, and answers. Uh, being very specific using examples. Agree on the meaning of important words. Disagree openly with any member of the group. Make uh, statements, then invite questions and comments. Uh, jointly design ways to test disagreements and solutions. Solutions, dis, um, discuss undiscussable issues, keep discussions focused, uh, don't take cheap shots or create ir irrelevant sidetracks or otherwise distract, distract the group. Expect to have all members participate in all phases of the process, exchange relevant information with parties not at the table, and then make decisions by consensus, consensus and of course uh, conduct a self-critique. So um, every opportunity uh, and experience is an opportunity to uh, grow. So here's let's talk about multi-party negotiations a little bit. There are three key stages to manage: the uh, pre-negotiation stage, the actual negotiations, and then the agreement stage. In the next section, we address these three stages and identify what a single negotiator can do in the following situations. They want to ensure their own issues and interests are clearly incorporated into the final agreement. They want to ensure that the group reaches the highest quality and, and best possible final agreement. And there are uh, responsible for overseeing a multi-party negotiation process to ensure that many of the strategic and procedural complexities are uh, managed effectively. So, the pre-negotiation stage. This is the stage that's categorized by a lot of information uh, contact among parties. Parties work on a number of important issues. Who is at the table, whether coalitions can be formed, what number uh, member roles different parties will take, understanding the consequences of no agreement, and constructing an agenda. In the pre-negotiation stage, you have to identify participants, and parties must agree on who is invited to the talks, uh, which this may take time uh, with complex negotiations. Participants can be decided on the basis of any of the following. Who must be included if the deal is to be reached? Who could spoil the deal if they are excluded? Whose presence is likely to help other parties achieve their objectives? Whose presence is likely to keep other parties from achieving their objectives? And whose status will be enhanced by simply being at the table? 
in the pre-negotiation stage, we, you've got to consider coalitions and roles. Coalitions may f uh, form before negotiations begin or during negotiations, and coalitions may form to, to promote or block particular agenda items. There are three types of roles members play. Task roles, move the group toward conclusion, initiating, offering, information seeking, opinion seeking, elaborating, evaluating, coordinating, and energizing. Maybe you've played some of these roles in different uh, types of situations. Relationship roles that sustain good relationships. These are people who are encouraging. They're harmonizers. They, they do compromising. They do gatekeeping. And they maintain standards. And then self-oriented roles bring attention to an individual often at the expense of others blocking recognition seeking dominating and avoiding so in the pre-negotiation stage uh, there are some costs to no agreement in some one-on-one -on -one encounters a batna is an important during an impasse of course uh, we've talked about BATNA in many of our different videos, but it's really very clear on uh, you have to understand what your BATNA is, so you can consider that from other videos. Are the costs the same for every negotiator? Uh, different agents have different costs associated with no agreement. Members with a BATNA are likely to have more power. Uh, do all parties perceive their agreement and no agreement options accurately? In multi-party negotiations, perceptual biases likely affect negotiators by inflating their sense of power and ability to win. This may lead them to believe that the no agreement alternative is much better than it really is. And reality checking with others is important to keep biases under control. So the pre-negotiation stage with issues and agenda, there are many reasons why an agenda can be an effective aid. It establishes the issues that will be discussed. Depending on how the issues are worded, it can also define how each issue is discussed. It can define the order in which issues are discussed, and it can be used to introduce process issues as well as substantive issues simply by including them. It can assign time limits to various items, thereby indicating the importance of various issues. In the pre-negotiation stage, there's a connect model. Uh, in addition to creating an agenda, parties might also agree to abide by a set of ground rules, uh, ways to conduct themselves during the negotiation. The Connect model is a proven approach to build effective group relationships. So in the uh, Connect model, there really are four requirements uh, for relationship building. You have to ask yourself, can we agree to have constructive conversation so in order to do this you have to commit to a relationship and then make sure you create a safe uh, space to be able to talk about issues can our conversation be productive enough uh, to make a difference so in order to do so you have to narrow the discussion to one issue and then neutralize any defensiveness that may arise uh, can we understand and appreciate each other's perspective? And you could do this by simply explaining and then paraphrasing back and echoing hearing. And then can we commit to making improvements? So you change one behavior each and then track it. You know, things are done incrementally. So in the formal stage, you should appoint an appropriate chair. A multi-party negotiations benefit from a neutral chairperson implementing the following tactics. Implicitly describing their role, introducing an agenda based on issues, concerns, and parties, uh, make logistical arrangements, introduce ground rules, create or review decision standards and rules. Assure members that they will have opportunity to speak and get their issues on the table. Be an active gatekeeper. Listen for interests and commonalities. Introduce external information that will illuminate the issues. And then summarize frequently, particularly when stalled, confused, or tense. 
in the formal stage you have to uh, use and restructure time to time and an agenda really is critical to controlling the flow and direction of negotiations introduced and coordinated either by a chair or the other parties and it provides low power groups a way of getting their issues addressed how an agenda is built and who builds it will greatly impact the negotiation flow negotiators facing an unacceptable preemptive agenda should let others know they consider that uh, the agenda should be open to discussion and in other words make sure the agenda of modifications are part of the agenda Agendas may uh, artificially uh, partition related issues. Be willing to challenge the reconfigure an agenda if it leads to an integrative agreement. So again, you know, saying, do we agree on the agenda? Are there any recommendations for changes? What would you like to see? Those kinds of things allow people to have ownership in the processes that take place and it creates safety. So, in the formal stage, diversity of information perspectives. The third way to facilitate the negotiation is to ensure the parties receive a variety of perspectives about the task and sources of information. The nature of information changes depending on the task. The chair should ensure that input is received from everyone and that the relevant data is circulated and discussed. Five key steps a chair can implement to ensure having an effective, amicable disagreement on a team. So one, collect your thoughts and composure before speaking. Try to understand the other person's position. Try to think of ways that you can both win. Remember, thinking win-win is really key to any negotiation. Consider how important the issue is to you. And then finally, remember that you'll probably have to work together. Uh, with these people in the future so uh, big picture type stuff formal the formal stage that uh, is that you have to consider also available information so uh, parties seldom consider that uh, the discussion norms that they're going to follow and that there are several things that can undermine an effective decision unwillingness to tolerate conflicting points of view and perspectives, side conversations, no means for diffusing an emotional charge, and then coming uh, to a meeting unprepared. So always be prepared. Uh, strategies may manage these uh, potentially destructive norms. One is the Delphi technique. That's when a moderator sends out a questionnaire to all parties and they ask for input. And so generally... Uh, these things you just write down on the on the paper what your thoughts are and then the moderator will read uh, what's been shared. In brainstorming parties define a problem and generate many solutions as possible without critiquing any of them and then in the nominal group to technique uh, evaluates brainstorm solutions. So if you've taken my classes uh, before, you've probably heard of these concepts before. It's all about effective decision making and there's, there's processes in place and systems that help make the decision making more effective. So also in the formal stage, you have to remember that you have to manage conflict effectively. When you see things differently than other people, uh, things can get heated. And so uh, really you have to be able to generate many different ideas and approaches to uh, any kind of problems that occur. And so we don't want to avoid conflict. We want to manage conflict properly. So when done well, conflict can be a natural part of the decision-making process. It's a how things are said. How, and we all have the power to influence other people. When, it, when it's done poorly, conflict uh, can disrupt the whole process. You know, one study examined three kinds of conflict uh, typical to work groups. There's the relationship conflict where there are these interpersonal incompatibilities. There's task conflicts, differences in viewpoints about the group's tasks, and then process conflicts where uh, there's conflict on how task accomplishment uh, will proceed. High-performing groups had the following characteristics. Low but increasing levels of process conflict, low levels of conflict with a rise near the deadline, and then a moderate level of task conflict at the midpoint. So in this formal stage, let's talk about decision rules. So uh, decision rules, they have to be managed and how the group will decide what to do. 
So decisions can be made by a dictatorship, that's one person decides, or by oligarchy, a dominant minority coalition decides, a simple majority, one more person than half decides, two-thirds majority, quasi-consensus, uh, most parties agree, and those who dissent agree not to protest or raise objectives, true anonymity, and consensus, where everyone agrees. So just some considerations. Uh, determining decision rules before talks start significantly affects the process. Uh, if simple majority rules, coalitions may uh, form before deliberation. If consensus is the rule, the group must work hard to reach agreement. Finally, uh, in the formal stage, the first agreement. If the objective is, is consensus or the best quality solutions, negotiators should not strive to achieve it all at once. Instead, strive for a first agreement, then revise, upgrade, and improve. Uh, under multi-party conditions, achieving true consensus becomes more difficult even if a true consensus solution exists. It's often better to set more modest objectives to reach a preliminary agreement or a tentative consensus. The drawback is that many parties may be satisfied with the first solution. Resistance to further deliberations may be overcome by taking a break, encouraging the parties to critique and evaluate the agreement with plans to come back for the second negotiations so or a renegotiation anyway that in a nutshell in the last 17 minutes is uh, the essentials of what you should know about multi-parties groups and teams in negotiations I hope you've enjoyed the video and it will take something away from it and even more I hope that you have a great day because only you get to choose how you feel about it I'm dr. Paul Gerhardt